Well, thank you very much. I, as you heard, I'm Swedish and I live in Stockholm, Sweden. And some people have suggested that it's a bit insensitive for me to write a book documenting how America's infatuation with easy money and home ownership uh, created the financial crisis. But let me assure you that many of these causes uh, were global in its nature and many countries and many economies tried to create a global financial fiasco. But only America had the size and the wealth to really do it. And I'm here now to try to walk us through the causes, the reasons why we really got into this mess in the first place. But let me start in the summer of 2005, because at that time we could actually see the real estate bubble on American television. Because at that time there was a reality show starting in the network TLC called Property Ladder, a British invention following a couple of people who bought a house, borrowed all the money, and then they fixed it up a little bit, and then they sold it at an incredible profit just months later. And only 21 days later, another reality show started in, the, in Discovery Home Channel called Flip This House, about flippers following people who borrowed money to buy a house, fixed it up a little bit, and sold it at an impressive profit a couple of months later. Nine days later, the A&E network didn't want to be Worse off, so they started their own reality show called Flip That House about, well, you know the idea by now. People borrowing money to buy a house and then they moved some furniture from one room to another and then they sold the house at an incredible profit just days later. Because this was the sense that we had at, this, at that time in the American real estate market but also around the world that it seemed like prices could only inflate. Prices could only rise, and you were a loser if you weren't part of the housing market. Because even if your income wasn't that impressive, even if your job might be in danger, it didn't really matter, because when house prices increased by 10 to 15% every year, it meant that you could refinance. You could take an extra mortgage on the house because of this increase, and then you could pay off other, the, the first mortgage, you could pay for more consumption, and therefore it was just a benefit. Well, this whole process, this whole show, could also be called How to Ruin the Economy in Seven Easy Steps. And I'm going to talk about those steps, um, not by design, not consciously, but because of unintended consequences of human action, something that often happens when we do things. And to start it off, it started where it often starts, with monetary policy and with, with easy money in the economy. Let's go back to an era that's very much resembles our own. People, there's an economic crisis, rise in unemployment, people are afraid of a Japanese-style deflation, they're afraid of possibly a 30s-style depression. So we have to look at Fed and hope that they're going to save us with more liquidity, with lower interest rates, and that is what happened in 2001 after the, real, after the dot com bubble and after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke and his other colleagues, uh, what they did in the few years following that was that they lowered interest rates dramatically, more than they've ever done before, from 6.75% to 1.75% at the end of the year. And they kept reducing the interest rate to 1% in midst of 2003. And this wasn't uh, just a temporary response to this crisis. This was a uh, really a discretionary policy to um, make sure that uh, they, the economy had a better shape for the long term and avoided possible deflation, possible depression. As Alan Greenspan has defended the rate cut in 2003, this was not an attempt to save an, an economy from a crash because and I quote, we agreed on the reduction despite our consensus that the economy probably did not need yet another rate cut. The stock market had finally begun to revive and our forecast called for much stronger GDP growth in the year's second half. Yet we went ahead on the basis of a balancing of risk. We wanted to shut down the possibility of corrosive deflation. We were willing to chance that by cutting rates we might foster a bubble, an inflationary boom of some sort, which we would subsequently have to address. End of quote. And, well, now we're in the subsequently and we are now addressing it. Because when you lower interest rate, that's dramatically and for such a long period. And when you tell people that this is something that's for the considerable future, 
then you change and distort all the incentives on the financial market. As one investor put it, I don't want to be in equities anymore with these low interest rates, and I'm not getting any return in my bond positions. So two things happen. We take on more and more leverage, and we reach for riskier asset classes. Give me yield. Give me leverage. Give me return. End of quote. Because it was suddenly expensive to have capital of your own. You don't get any returns, but it's lucrative to use other people's capital. And this affects financial markets. You'll get more leverage. You'll get smaller margins, less capital. Uh, but it also affects households, of course. With those interest rates, we also see that easy money, easy money is step one. Step two is that easy money turns into more mortgages. And we can see that the price rise in housing is quite dramatic over these few years. In 2002, a year of recession, we could still see an increase in housing prices. In 2003, it climbed further, and we could see an increase by 10 to 15 percent every year in the American cities. Because money always ends up somewhere, and if people don't want, uh, if they're afraid of the stock market after the dot-com bubble, if they're uh, not interested in, in bonds and savings, well, then they might be interested in putting them in the house, where it seems uh, very, very safe. And if prices could then begin to rise, you become even more interested in refinancing, in building bigger, in buying something even larger. It felt like getting a house for free with these interest rates, as one investor put it when he bought his second house. And you could then see your house as the new ATM machine. This is where you get new cash to fund your consumption. In 2002, a year of recession, American households borrowed $269 billion more to fund new consumptions on their old houses. And especially people did this in states, non-recourse states, where it's possible to get a loan and return the key to the bank if the mortgage goes sour and go walk away without any, any uh, debts left. But this wasn't just a spontaneous process by the households. If uh, easy money and money into mortgages were something that, that happened because of interest rates, we also see, saw a political push from Democrats and Republicans from the left to right, a very bipartisan consensus that home ownership rates is one of the most important indicators of the health of society. And trying to increase this rate by just a few percentage points really makes it legitimate with quite dramatic um, policies. As President Bush put it in 2002, we use the mighty muscle of the federal government in combination with state and local governments to encourage owning your own home. And there was a battery of political activities and policies that aimed at this. We had the tax deductions on mortgage rates, we had government insurance policies, we had pressure on private lenders, and most of all, we had the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which had as their sole purpose of getting more mortgages out there on the market and make sure that people who couldn't get credit on the market could do that anyway. These weren't small corporations. They were some of the biggest in the world, and they had a political goal set by Congress and the administration to increase mortgages. They weren't small, as I said. In 94, Fannie Mae alone introduced their trillion-dollar commitment, $1,000 billion going to people who could not afford a mortgage on the private market. In, 2000, in the year of 2000, that was done, so they started their American Dream commitment, $2 trillion with the same purpose. And this grew more and more radical. And under the Bush administration, at the moment when we saw these reality shows explaining that you, you can flip a house because prices increased that dramatically, the Bush administration raised the goals for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, saying that it used to be 50% of the loans that, that should be going to people with a low income. Now it should be 56%. It used to be 20% going to people with a very low income. It should be 28%. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had to respond by buying more subprime mortgages, buying mortgages based on credit uh, that was hurt in some way or another, people who weren't considered credit worthy on the market. In the year of 2004 alone, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bought $175 million of subprime loans. 